Stabilizing and predictions today. Um, so homework six and lab five are due today, um, but there is not a new homework for uh, like this cycle. Uh, so instead, work on project two. Um, remember, you can always do more of project two than the check, right? It might be hard because some of the like the timing of the lectures kind of coincides with when you might get to that part of the project. Uh, so you know, take it with a grain of salt, but you don't have to wait to submit it if you're interested in doing it early. Um, that's it. Any questions so far? All right. So, just a little bit of a recap the variability oops, of the sample average. The distribution of all possible sample averages of a given size is called the distribution of the sample average. So, we approximate it with the empirical distribution and with the um, uh, central limit theorem is roughly normal. Uh, center is the population average, and the uh, standard deviation is equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And I don't know why I have the word demo right there, but I should delete that from the slide because it's not a demo on yet. Um, so the central limit theorem is if the sample is large and drawn at random with replacement, then regardless of the distribution of the population, the probability distribution of the sample average is roughly normal. So like a normal curve, so like a bell curve. And the mean is equal to the population mean, and the standard deviation is equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so we're going to leverage those facts to be able to do some of our prediction work. All right, so here's kind of it is in the same, basically the same thing, but in picture form, right? Oh, not on that slide. Oh, sorry. So this is the slide I was just talking about. I had it up here and not there. Um, but this is the same thing in picture form. So you have uh, kind of that normal curve, right? And then you have the population standard deviation by the square root of the sample size, right? And then the population average. So this is just kind of the picture version of the same. If you like pictures better. Um, it's really annoying. Oops, I can't see completely up there. Um, okay, so kind of pointing out the various features of this picture, right? One standard deviation above the mean and two standard deviations above the mean. So about 95% of all samples, the sample average and population average are within two, two standard deviations of each other. So in other words, if you kind of wrap around that yellow bar by standard deviation, by two standard deviations on each side, that's going to be the 95% of your population. And as I kind of said last lecture or the one before, um, that's a interesting number, right? Because when we talk about that key cutoff, we tend to talk about 5% and 1%. Um, so, hey, look, 5% is left when we say 95% of the samples. I do not understand this. It really kind of me crazy. Um, Okay, so for 95% of all samples, if you stand on the population average and look to standard deviations either direction, um, you'll find the sample average. Um, and the distance is symmetric, which is handy. And so you will capture the population average on kind of right in there. Um, so kind of kind of a few different ways of saying the same thing. Um, And then it kind of, uh, yeah, actually, maybe I can cut some of these, but this is kind of the same thing with a different kind of picture. Um, but what we really get down to is that 95% of the confidence intervals for the population average, four times the standard deviation of the sample average, and four times the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. In other words, the like the first line, right, if you replace standard deviation with its actual constant, like how you calculate it, um, so what does that mean? We can now, we can just use that bottom one, right? And be able to calculate where uh, the, what, uh, where that average is with a confidence interval, right? Which is useful. Um, and we're gonna go through, I think I'm gonna do an example in a second. Let me just make sure where we are. Yeah, so as I told you last time, uh, we're a little bit ahead of a lecture, plus uh, 
um, a case study. So we actually have another duplicate side in here um, because I did bad cutting and pasting. So apologies. But so if we talk about this particular data set, okay, and we talked about one that was similar to this, right, with the Botox example, um, but just imagine that the data is just, you know, zeros and ones. So true, false, right? Okay. And just to make it very, very simple. Um, and so what we can do is if we just sum whatever our result is, now we know kind of how many trues there are, okay? Um, and you can actually do this in Python. You can actually just sum the actual trues and falses because false is zero and true is one. So if you add them all up, you'll get the same as if they were zeros and ones. Um, so that can be handy. I'm pretty confident that's used in the project or maybe it's the homework, I don't know, I thought recently. Um, so, but then we can easily get to the average, right? So we get four divided by 10 is 0.4, and that's the proportion of ones. Um, so if the population consists of ones and zeros, then the population mean is the proportion of ones in the population, and the sample mean is the proportion of ones in the sample. So imagine, right, we, if we want to pull a sample out of that, we have, those were two different numbers, right? One is the, the real one, and one is our estimate based on the samples. And this is a picture of I did already, um, but controlling the width. Um, yeah, and so this kind of alludes back to what we talked about a couple of lectures ago, which is that you know the more the narrower we can make that interval. So in other words, the, the shorter or the smaller the standard deviations are, right? Which will bring it in, right? Because if we have four standard deviations and each standard deviation is two, right? Then it's smaller than if each standard deviation is eighteen. Right. So the narrower we can make it, the better our estimations are. So our goals are to make those the standard deviations of our samples. We want to bring that that down so that we can get tighter to our answers. Um, and so if we want to do no more than one percent, how should you choose the sample size? So for example, um, as you hopefully know. Uh, the mayor of Boston is a woman named Michelle Wu, um, and so when she was running for election, it's the percent, what we're trying to capture in the election, right, is the percent of voters who support Wu for office, so that's a yes-no, right, so we're just going to pretend that, that we're either going to elect her as mayor or we're going to do nothing, okay, uh, obviously it's not quite real, but if a voter supports Wu, then we mark a one, otherwise we mark a zero. And so this is where we get into some of the, the like lingo, okay? And so we refer to p hat, okay? Uh, that little carrot symbol over that. Um, how many people know carrot? Um, that's the character over what is it? Five, six? Um, yeah, six. Uh, is often referred to as a hat because it looks like a little hat. And so the p is our actual value, and the estimate of p is equal to our p hat. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out, right, is we wanted to go, uh, like, we want to know how far away we are, so that's why we use uh, those uh, symbols. Like I said, I think we're going to show an example, which might make it a little bit clearer. And so, but what we're actually getting down to is that we want our sample size to be as small as possible, right, uh, as we can possibly get it with still getting to some level of accuracy. Because why? Anybody remember? Right, so bigger samples are more expensive in, in whatever you need in this particular case by expensive. Could be computationally, could be gathering data, et cetera. So you always want to make the smallest sample you possibly can. And for, I think in this scenario, a lot of times those sample sizes are actually quite a bit small. Uh, like the size you have to pull is actually less than you might think it is. We have an example of that later. Um, so, uh, so here's kind of that calculation, um, and all right, but here's the example. Oh, sorry, but before we get into that example, I wanted to give one more example of the bootstrap. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, our babies that we keep talking about. Um, and I don't think we talked about this particular bootstrap example, um, but so the first thing I'm doing is kind of pulling a histogram out of it, but I particularly want to point out a couple of things that aren't quite yet. So the first thing I want to do is go find out what's the actual, the like the real average of this data set. 
um, basically so I can compare. Uh, do I want to turn on filter keys? I don't want filter keys on, so no. Um, okay, so the first thing we do in our process, right, is we create a method that is going to essentially give us one of our estimates, okay? And this is really important because what we're trying to do, right, is we want to do our sampling or our estimation, whatever way you want to call it, um, we want to do that a bunch of times. Okay, so the first thing we do is write some kind of method that is going to actually get us one sample's answer, okay? And so that's what this case is. We're going to say one bootstrap mean. It doesn't really matter what it's called, right? Normally, um, you know, I actually would probably tie it more closely to uh, the data set that I'm looking at. But by way of example, so one bootstrap mean, this is an example of a bootstrap. So we're going to use that terminology here. But so what it does is it does the sampling, but then it actually calculates the mean. So we can get that one method does one experiment. Okay. Then we go into the next method or the next section here. And I'm going to run it in case it takes a while. Um, but yeah, no. um, so what we're going to do here is okay, now we've got one way of getting one uh, experiment, right? So instead, what I want to do is I don't want just one, I want a thousand. But in order to do that, I need to collect the results of the experiments as I go along. I don't want to just throw away each of the experiments. I want to do an experiment, then do another one, then do another one, and collect all those, you know, in a bucket or something so that I have the results. So in order to do that, I first create an array because I need a place to put, like I need to get my bucket first, right? I can't just pour water in and then hope that the bucket appears. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is make a bucket. And that's what my make array is doing there is just an empty bucket. Then I'll do my for loop. And so this is let us repeat something over and over again. Um, and I'll call my method there that is doing one of my experiments. I'll call, just get the result into new mean. And this is really just for readability, right? I could just put one bootstrap mean right here, right? But for readability, I tend to pull it into its own variable first. Um, and then I'm just going to append it onto my bucket, right? Or in other words, I'm going to put my result in my bucket. Uh, and then here's me printing the results, basically. But let me ask you a slightly different question. What would be another way, if I didn't have the for loop, to do this? Like imagine I don't have a for loop and I'm not a super lazy programmer. The answer is very obvious. Not a trick. Any ideas? Think about what the for loop is doing. What is the for loop doing? Give <coughs> an answer. Do it a thousand times. Yeah, type it in a thousand times, right? Okay, I can just put the, those two lines over and over and over and over again. Okay, but I'm lazy, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a for loop. So, but it's exactly the same as if I had typed it in a thousand times, except that I can make it a thousand and one, or let's say 50,000 much more easily, right? Because I can just change the one to a five, and now I have 50,000 rather than having to copy another 40,000 examples. Okay, but that's all there is to it. There's nothing real magic about it. All it's doing is making so you can take some writing. And then finally, what we're doing here is in this particular example, we're looking at that left and right edges. Okay, and so here are the edges of our gestational age, I think, uh, for those averages. And then I can kind of go on and print it. So we've, we've done this on this data. Well, I don't know if we did this exact data set, but like on this data set uh, a couple of times. But as you can see, right, we have this blue dot, which is where, where we actually calculated it to be. Okay, but then our yellow is our window of where uh, where our experiments fell. Okay, because we don't normally have the blue dot, right? So yeah. And how many samples does, does like the default sample take? Uh, so if you use the method sample, it does by default everything. So it goes and grabs the whole set again. Um, and the reason that's why, and, and if you notice, right, the defaults are actually weirdly aligned with Bootstrap. Why are they weirdly aligned with bootstrap? Because bootstrap is really often the most common way of doing this, uh, you know, of trying to actually do these experiments. 
Uh, so that's why samples defaults happen to align with bootstrap. All right. So what I wanted to show here too was our confidence interval. Okay, so we took our data with the gestational age, right? And this is a lot of code, I know. Um, and you don't have to worry about it too much. Everything in here, uh, with the exception of using the stats library, you should be able to write. It's just complicated. So we're not going to do that today in class. Um, but I want to show you what its output was. Yeah. Yeah, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. So before with like sample, if it samples the whole population set uh, every time, then how does it get different means each time? Because it's sampling. So it's going, I want row two, and then I want row four, and then I want row five. But then the next time through, it says I want row 10 and 16 and one, but it does it for all of them. But it's basically just reordering. Right? So it's more like, like think of it as like it's shuffling. That's what it means by sample. Oh, um, and with replacement. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the crux yeah. of what you're getting at. Sorry. Okay, so the reason I want to show you this is because I showed you this graph before that was kind of a manufactured one, but this is a real one. Okay, so what we did here is our red lines, right, are ones that did not fall in our test or they, they fell outside of our expectation. So as you can see, right, we have those averages and then the window in which that thing fell. So like, or point at it, maybe a little easier to read or understand. Uh, so this red line, right? So here's the average. Um, and this is kind of the, the smallest sample average. And this is kind of the highest sample average. And then here in this range is where all the samples landed for this run of a thousand experiments. Okay, so remember, each experiment uh, is going to pull a whole sample and then do an average. Then we're going to do each experiment a thousand times. And then in this case, I can't remember exactly how many, but we have number of these lines, numbers of thousand time sets of experiments. Make sense? Okay, and so what we end up with is we see that these blue lines, right, that here's where we think the average is, okay? Because when we run all of those experiments, this is kind of what we end up. Uh, we obviously still get some outliers, so it won't be perfect. And for all we know, except we do know, but for all we know, the actual average, the actual thing we're looking for is one of these, right? It could be outside of the range. It's just that there's a very low chance of it being true, okay? Like less than 1% or less than 5%. Okay. Yeah, so that was what I wanted to show there. Um, then I was going to go back over here. Um, then. Do you all see? Uh, does anybody have a class notebook? Do you see that um, something about the zero slash one sampling? Wait, you're gonna just didn't get that far. Nope, it's missing. Uh, let me let's do it this way. Make sure it's in here. Oh, no. Nope. All right, so you do not have this bit prep, but it's only like six lines, so it shouldn't be too big a deal. Bring this. 
Okay, so this was the example I wanted to show, which is the standard deviation of this zero slash one population. Okay, so in other words, like a true false, true false, or false true population, I presume. Uh, so this is kind of an example of running it through. So imagine we're doing that voting scenario. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to create a pretty small example. Um, and so first thing we do is just kind of create a sample uh, of the zero and one population, okay? Um, and but we're setting in advance so we know what's going on, basically for the sake of our example, not how you would do it in the real world, right? You use real data. Um, we just kind of create an array that's got two of the ones and uh, whatever is left over of the of the zeros, okay? So now we can look at that and we see, okay, what's the standard deviation of that population? Um, and this is, if you remember way back, uh, I told you that when Python does math, sometimes it makes mistakes, especially towards the outside edge of decimals. So that one over there is a mistake, okay? So you want to kind of keep that in mind when you're using really big floats that, especially out on the right edge of a float, uh, there can be mistakes. So, but usually they're small enough, they don't matter. Um, okay, so what we do first is what I kind of just showed you, which is, hey, we're going to go and figure out how do we do one experiment, okay? And that's what this SD of zero, one population, the number of ones, um, with one experiment. So, okay, great. So now what I want to do is I'm going to create a table that has kind of the uh, options, right? And actually, let me. Oh, I'll print it in the next one. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so now we have just a table of like all the options. Right? So in our in our vote results, we could have had um, you know no votes for uh, Michelle Wu. We could have one. We could have two. We could have three, etc. Then we just calculate what's the proportion. So what's uh, you know how many of them are ones, um, and then what's the standard deviation? Okay, and the reason we're doing that is because I want to show you this graph, kind of showing you how it works. Right, is that this. If you kind of see it's like an arc, right? And so that arc is showing us uh, at least how that population is going to flow depending on how, um, what data we got. So I'm trying to think there's a, yeah. So if you if you think about that kind of that picture, it's, it's showing us the variation of what could be happening when you have certain populations. Um, uh, I'll probably try to cover that again in another lecture, just because I don't think that's probably the story I really wanted to tell. But um, if we do the calculation that we talked about in the slides, so our standard deviation of a zero one population divided by, um, actually, let me look at the. So. Oh, this is what I was looking for. Um, okay, so if we look at if we look at that curve, what we can figure out is basically what's the sample size we need if we're doing certain kinds of populations. So we can figure out the sample size we need by using the we can get the square root of the sample size is equal to four times the standard deviation of a zero one population divided by 0 0.01. Okay, so why do we care about the worst case, right? So this is the smallest the sample size can be, but no bigger, or no no small. Sorry. Um, so that's why we really care. So if that population that we're looking at, um, the sample size should be forty thousand or more. If the scenario that we have above is true, so in other words, like um, if the standard deviation of our population <laughs> is zero point five. Um, and we know we want four standard deviations, um, and we want, and so we divide by 0 0.1, or sorry, 0 0.01, um, and then we kind of can calculate out that we need 40,000 samples, okay, or 40,000 experiments. 
Okay, I don't know. Hopefully that makes sense. Like I said, I'll try to uh, I'll try to cover it again in a different way uh, in a future lecture. Um, because basically this is where we're getting to, which is that um, this is actually kind of an interesting article if you go and read it. Um, but you can sample a poll, right, of only a thousand Americans and actually represent their 260 million people with 3% margin of error, right? So you can actually get a, a, a really, really small amount of, of samples, like our, you know, data uh, in order to still represent a fairly large population. Um, that's why I don't love the prior example because it doesn't like prove this, right? Which would you know, come back and maybe try to prove this one. But the point being is that uh, you can actually get quite small samples if you use something like the bootstrap method uh, to try to figure out if your sample is good, or to try to figure out your average or whatever you're trying to figure out. All right. Oh, I do prove it. There we go. Okay. So the part that you might immediately notice, right, is that it's plus or minus 3%. So what we actually mean is 6%. So that's a little bit higher than we've normally been talking about. But for the purposes of whatever story they were writing, that was enough. Okay, so we normally talk about, or we've been talking about 5% and 1%. In this case, it's 6%. But that means plus or minus 3%. So, uh, so we know that it's 6%. So we take the square root of the sample size is greater than four times 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.06. So in other words, if you kind of jump a little bit to the end, we can kind of draw up a map and we, we get to the sample size being equal to just over 1,111, right? So 100, 1,112 should be enough um, in order to uh, represent the population size that we're looking for with 6% accuracy, okay? Not the five we've been talking about or the one we've been talking about. Um, and it would not surprise me, right? If you look at this map, that if you do drop it to 5%, it's actually going to raise that number by quite a lot. So it, it's probably fine, right? Um, and you can say plus or minus 3%, it's probably close enough for most estimations that we want to do. So maybe we don't quite need the level of accuracy uh, that we typically use. Now, on the flip side, you know, if we're doing, you know, like a vaccination, like the vaccination example, maybe we do want 5% or even less, right? Uh, and so we need to do bigger samples. Does this make sense? Okay, I'm pretty sure this is also covered like in a homework or a lab or something. Um, so you'll probably work through it yourself as well. All right. So where is all this leading to, right? All of this, really the goal most of the time is the kind of part I allude to a lot but don't actually say is that what we want to be able to do is predict things. Right, because all of this is great, but knowing the histor you know, historical fact of whether juries are created, you know, are actually evenly divided uh, based on the population, or knowing, you know, uh, the the gestational age of, you know, or like the whether kids can uh, 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 have lower birth weights if their parents smoke, all that stuff. Okay, you know, like great history, yay. What we really care about is what does it tell us about the future, right? And so that's kind of what we're getting into now, which is that prediction factor, is how do we how do we use that information to make predictions about the future? All right. So usually our information is incomplete. And so what we want to do is predict an outcome for an individual, right? That's usually the goal. Um, and remember, these are the the formal words, right? So it's it's whatever we're measuring, which is the outcome, and the individual, which could be just a, it's just a thing, right? It's not necessarily a person; it's just an individual item. So what we want to do is one one approach to prediction, okay? And as you might imagine, kind of like I was talking about before, or right, like in prior lectures, is that um, as you might imagine, in order to predict the future, we can't always use the same technique. Right. Some techniques work better than others in certain scenarios. So this is one approach, okay, which is that we're going to say, okay, why don't we find other people who are like the individual that we want to predict about? 
um, and then we can uh, uh, with data that we know about um, and use those outcomes as the basis of your prediction. So um, that second bullet, has anybody ever heard of the term um, ground truth? Ever heard this term? Okay, so ground truth is another way of saying whose outcomes you know. Okay, it's kind of slangy, but it is very, very common. So when I say I know, and we're going to talk about the Galton data uh, here in a minute, um, but when I say I know uh, that this person's height was this, that's called a ground truth. Okay, and it comes from I was on the ground and verified it to be true. Okay, so like I walk up to somebody and say, "What's up, are you?" Right. So that's why it's called a ground truth. So often when you say, when you're talking about the data set you have, you'll refer to it as ground truth. Okay, so if you see that term, that's where it comes from. Any questions? Okay. So now we're going to do a prediction example. And so this should be the part, like the next part after you had it in the slide or in the notebook already. Um, I'm going to go back to that one. And so the first thing here is I'm just generating a bunch of uh, functions that um, are primarily for looks. Uh, so don't worry about them too much. Feel free to try to figure them out. Have any questions about them? Feel free to come to office hours, ask me about them. Uh, they are not all that complex, but you don't really need them. Okay, so getting into prediction. So I think we've talked a little bit about the Galton data before. But as a reminder, uh, the only two columns we're going to care about here is the average heights of the parents and then the actual height of the child. Okay, so both of these pieces of data are ground true. We know that the mid parent, right, mid parent is the average height of the two parents, and the child is the height of them after they're uh, done growing. Okay, so let's say they, they were all measured at 30 rather than at, you know, 14. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is create a scatter plot. Okay, and we now just can say, okay, now we can see there's the relationship between these two things. This is why a scatter plot is so nice. Um, and we can say, okay, here's the mid parent averages on the bottom, uh, and here's the child heights on the side. Um, and so we can say, based on our data that we have, we know that, you know, this uh, one child of a 71 inch uh, average parent size happened to be about 64 inches tall, okay? All right, so the next thing we do is kind of like we were doing before, is we usually want to kind of wrap up our kind of experimental work, excuse me, in a method or two methods so that we can then uh, kind of do it a bunch of times, right? So in this case, what we want to do is wrap our prediction up in this function called predict child. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go and find all the uh, parents who are nearby. Okay, so this is sometimes also called um, point the other one. Uh, uh, nearest neighbors prediction. Okay, so when, when they're nearby, uh, they're referred to as neighbors. So nearby neighbors or nearest neighbors. Uh, and so you see we're going to go find all those parents that are between half an inch on either the side of the height of, of the parent, of this particular mid-parent. Um, and then we're going to actually try to figure out the average of the children in that space so that we can make a prediction based on other or for other child. Hopefully that makes sense. So the first thing we do, um, usually when we're trying to do this kind of work, uh, is we actually predict all the data that we have, okay? So we take the data that we have and we pretend like we don't have all the child heights and we basically do a prediction against them all so that we can, I think it's the next slide, so that we can actually look at the result, okay? So what we see is those yellow dots, it may look like a line from, you know, kind of way in the back, but it's a bunch of dots which is those individual predictions based on the new parent heights. All right. So, go back to the slides. 
Okay, so what we are starting to notice though is that, or one of the things I wanted to point out is that when we have, if you kind of ignore the yellow line, let's go back up here for a second. When we have a circle like this, okay, you notice that the graphic kind of results, it's pretty circular, right? Or even uh, American football shaped, okay? So it's, it's starting to be pretty circular. So that indicates something about the data. All right, and particularly, or specifically, what it indicates is that um, there's an association here. Uh, and so we can actually look at the shape and actually tell what kind of association it has. And so, yeah, so kind of jumping uh, tracks a little bit. Um, I don't I don't think we've talked about this data set yet. Um, did we, did we talk about this one, remember? Okay, so this is a set of hybrid car data, okay? Uh, it's a little bit dated, uh, so there's, there's actually significantly more hybrid and electric cars on this list now that are not in this data set, so just kind of ignore that. Um, but we have uh, basically the, the type of the vehicle, then we have the year that the vehicle was, I think it's introduced. Um, yeah. There may be repeats, I can't remember exactly, but, um, and then we have the MSRP, okay, so this is, I mean, what MSRP stands for? Manufacturer suggested the price. Right on. Okay, so this is basically the, the list price of the thing, okay? Cars, like other expensive items, usually are uh, something that's negotiated from a price perspective, but this is what the manufacturer lists it as. Um, and then this is the acceleration. So this is uh, typically zero to 60 uh, miles per hour in how many seconds, okay? So that indicates the acceleration. This is mile per gallon, MPG. Uh, and then this is the class of car that it is, okay? All right, so the first thing we wanna look at is which ones are the most expensive cars so we can just sort it. And we see that this Lexus is uh, $118,000. That, that's kind of an expensive car. Um, and then this active hybrid, I actually don't know who the maker is of that car. Um, and that one is $104,000, et cetera. Right, it goes down from there. Um, I just think it's kind of crazy that the, the Porsche is down here, right? But if we have a Lexus higher up. Um, I certainly think of Porsche is a more expensive car than Lexus. Um, all right, so one of the things we might want to look at, right, is where are these relationships, okay? And so does a more expensive car have better gas mileage or worse, right? So anybody have any guesses or theories? Like you can see the graphic. Worse. Worse. Any idea why they tend to be worse? Um, they might more powerful engines. Right, they, they tend to be faster, right? Like uh, uh, somebody who wants to spend a lot of money on a car tends to also want that car to be fast. Uh, and so uh, they tend to use more gas because they have bigger engines, right? So, but not all the time, right? I mean, you, you see, it's not it's not like a perfect relationship. It's kind of a little bit old, of course. Um, for example, I actually had a, a Civic, a Honda Civic four-door sedan, Right, that because it made like nothing, had a ridiculous acceleration, um, even though it didn't have that great an engine, but it was really, really light, probably also super dangerous. But you know, okay. All right. So what you do see though, right, kind of to that same point, oops, okay, right? um, is that when the price of the car, oh, I always see this backwards. This acceleration measurement is uh, inverted to what I think it is. Um, I, I always say it backwards, I don't know why, but a higher number on this acceleration is faster, okay? Or, or it accelerates faster. Um, normally when you talk about cars, you talk about like zero to 60 in how many seconds? This is some other measure that uh, I always forget. Um, so apologies, but the point being is that as we kind of noticed before, right, or guess, that if we have higher acceleration, so more acceleration, it tends to be a more expensive car, okay? Um, and then 
in the for the case of this example, we're going to pull out all the cars that are classified as SUVs. Okay, um, which is sport utility vehicle. If you didn't know what SUV stood for, and if you look at most SUVs on the street, the thing I think of is not sport utility, right? Like I don't know about you, but um, they're, I'm not really thinking that people are going hiking in that very often. All right. So if we look at that acceleration versus MSRP, we still kind of see that same trend, right? Is that mostly the kind of the more, the faster cars are mostly the more expensive ones, um, but not entirely. Because sometimes there's other trade-offs, especially when we talk about something like an SUV, when we classify the type of car, it might have other goals than say, you know, the car cars in average, <laughs> right? And then miles per gallon uh, versus MSRP, also kind of the same thing. Um, these are actually much better because I, I think the reason, I don't know if we're going to get into it. Yeah, so I think the reason is because um, the more expensive cars in the SUV class order are the ones that are hybrids. And so they uh, tend to have better gas mileage. Um, but the point is, is that if we wanted to start to look at the relationship between the acceleration and MSRP, right, and the relationship, and kind of compare it to the relationship of miles per gallon and MSRP, we can't really do that immediately. So we want to convert that to standard units. So we're going to do that. And so I hate making stupid mistakes. Um, all right, so does anybody remember how to create a function of those standard units? You want to play with it for a second? Any ideas? All right, so just remember X is an array of data that we want to convert to a standard units. So how do we do that? Yeah. P through NP dot Yes, that's part of it. But what do you what do you do with it? We subtract the average and divide by the standard deviation. Uh, you just subtract the number um, by uh, the standard deviation. Um, which I, I think is similar to what you're saying. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, is this maybe this is what you think? You subtract the uh, the number from the average, and then you divide, by. and then you divide that whole thing by the um, standard deviation. Uh, I would like to point out. Okay, uh, there were a lot of mistakes in the midterm of missing parentheses okay parentheses are your friend they're very very important please remember that uh i sometimes am so and so like unsure of whether or not uh something needs parentheses i will often put them in when they are unneeded okay so parentheses are your friend use them a lot please i hate when i see a question that is a hundred percent correct except they forgot those brown things right okay so if I convert to standard units, now what I can do is I can actually plot them together, right? Um, because, oh, sorry, this is just mile per gallon and MSRP. Um, it's on the next bit. Uh, but so now they're in standard units, so they're going to move to kind of shift, right, to be around zero. And so, And now we kind of move the other one to be around zero. And I don't think I have a good like picture of this, but now you can actually compare the two, right? You can actually look at them and they're both in the same, you know, plane, for lack of a better term, um, because now they're all right around zero on both the X and the Y axis. And so now we can kind of look at the, the relationship between them and we can see, oh, look, the MRSRP and the miles per gallon and the acceleration. Um, we can start to draw conclusions as well as it makes uh, other kinds of work that we're going to do simpler. 
All right. So when I was talking about the uh, that American football looking thing, one of the things that we can do by looking at the picture, right, is that the math version of it is called R, okay, or the correlation coefficient. This is this should have a big, huge magnifying glass on it, okay. So, um, but the R of a relationship measure the linear association. So if the R is equal to one, then the scatter between the two is a perfect like line like this. Okay, we're gonna see a bunch of examples, but it's a perfect line like this. So what is what does that mean between the X and the Y? If we have a line that looks like that, what is the relationship between the X and the Y? Positive or like every time you go kind of up by one, Right on the on the x axis, you're going to go up by one on the y axis, right? If it's a straight line, because that way, and we know they're direct, like they're always in lockstep, right? Um, and then a negative one is basically the opposite, okay? Um, and just to be clear, right, it's a positive and negative association, but that doesn't mean like it's a bad association, it just means that there's a negative relationship, and then one goes down while one goes up. Um, and then zero means there's no relationship. Right? And so, oops, forgot this is good. So, these next. So, we have this uh, little function that is created up above, right? That will just randomly create a scatter plot based on a particular correlation coefficient. So, this is a negative one, right? So, we're basically a line sloping down. Um, let me see if I get some more screen real estate. Uh, and then we have a, sign, a line going up because the R, the correlation coefficient, is one. Okay. And then we have one that's a zero. And so that's just the big blob. Okay. So basically, if it's just the big blob, that tells you that there's not really a relationship there. Okay. But if there's a line, then there is. Um, and then you can kind of vary in the middle. Um, and this one's a little hard to see, but this is a negative point two. Okay, so this is actually a descending one by a bit. Okay, so here is our actual negative one. So it looks like this, right? And then a negative point two. So just a little bit, uh, but there's. But if you look at it, right, you can see there. I mean, there, there's kind of a line there, right? It's kind of going down. Um, but so if you see those relationships. That tells you about the relationship between the x and the y values. Um, and then here's kind of the inverse, uh, except there's it's more pronounced. Okay, so this is 0.6. Uh, and so you can you can definitely start to see the line there. All right. All right, and so. The correlation coefficient is the average of the product of x in standard units and y in standard units. So now you also see why we think standard units are cool. Okay, so um, we take the y in standard units. So, so like I said, when you kind of say it out loud in English, you kind of say it in the reverse way that you do the work. So average of the product of x in standard units and y in standard units means we have to go get the y in standard units, then get the x in standard units. Then we want to take the product of x um, in standard units um, and then average of the product of the standard units in x. And All right, so measure how clustered the scatter is around the straight line. So we can calculate it. So the first thing we're just doing here is just creating a table that's got some numbers in it. Um, and we're going to throw that in the scatter plot. Okay. And so we can see hopefully um, that you know we have you know a couple of different dots on this line or on this uh, scatter plot. And the first thing we do is go and calculate those into standard units. And I'm going to go show you that method, which we made. Is it one we made already? Yeah, so we just converted them using that same standard units method. Um, and now we have two arrays, one that is of the X in standard units and one that's the Y in standard units. Um, and we just threw those on the table as well. All right. 
And so now we're going to do the product of those. Okay, so that just means the multiplication of those two numbers to each other. All right. And the way we do that, we just can, we can, as you recall, right, we can just multiply two arrays by each other. We get back an array of the result. So that way we can use this column. This is another one that a lot of people got wrong. Uh, column gives you an array back, right? Not select. Um, so we can, and then we just throw that in the table too, just because we're kind of collecting them somewhere. And then we can figure out the actual R. Okay, so now what we do is we take the average of the multiplication of our standard units um, and the, uh, yeah, so we can take the average of the two. Um, so so in, in this particular calculation, right, our products over here are a little bit throwaway because I'm basically redoing the multiplication again, right? So I'm just kind of showing you here's the product of the standard units. And, and at least for me, right, like they don't, they, they've kind of lost some of their like real meaning because now they're just more like positions on a graph. So that product is like, like, you know, product of what, right? Like, so, but really what we're looking for is kind of means to an end. That correlation coefficient tells us about their relationship. And that's what we're looking for. Even though the steps along the way are kind of like, meh. All right, so now, just catch up and make sure I'm writing the right code. All right, so now what I really want, right, is a method that will calculate correlation. And trust me when I say you will use this method a lot. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to get X in standard units. And I'm just going to write it out because it will be clearer but feel free to shorten it as much as you like. I would definitely normally do that. Um, okay, and then I call my standard units function with, now in this case, what I'm actually doing is my, my function wants to take a table and then a column name and then a column name. So I need to go and kind of pull a piece of it out. So the first thing I do is I get the column off the table that is called whatever is in the variable X. And then, oh, that's it for there. Then I basically do exactly the same thing, except this time I'm going to do whatever the name of the Y column is. Then I'm going to oops, average those out. Excuse me, that's what I was doing before. And I'm going to say X in, oh, well, X in units. Why well, I should change what I wrote. And I don't know why I have an extra question. Okay, so now I have a function that will calculate that correlation so that I can just use it more easily, right? So now if I call it with my original one, I should get the same value, right? And so this is me kind of just checking myself, make sure that my correlation function actually works correctly. Um, oops. Yeah, I do it All right. So now I can kind of do uh, the same thing with uh, those examples from that SUD table. And I can actually look at the correlation between the miles per gallon and the MSRP and the acceleration in the MSRP. Okay. So what do you all think of the relationship here? Right. So as the mile per gallon go up, right, which way does the MSRP go? Go down, right? And then in this one, um, as the acceleration, like the, the ability for acceleration, uh, the MSRP uh, goes up. Okay. All right. Um, and then the nice thing about this, right, is now we can do it in reverse. Um, so if we take that same table that we had before, um, and I just got to apply it twice. No reason. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, sir. So here's the scatter plot, right, of X versus Y. Okay, so X is on the X axis and Y is on the Y axis. And then this is it inverted. Okay, but it should just be kind of a mirror image of itself, right? Um, and that's also true for the correlation. So it should be the inverse. 
No, sorry, it's not true with the correlation. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, um, it's the same um, because the the relationship between them has is the same. It's just like kind of where it gets thrown on a map or on a on a scatter plot is uh, is going to look different. But our correlation is the same, right? Their relationship is the same because they are uh, they have the same correlation. I have been uh, misseeding all day long. It's really good. All right. So now the question is, as with most of the things we talked about, it doesn't always really work. So that's fine. so here are some examples of when it doesn't work. So we can get false conclusions of causation. We can get nonlinearity. So nonlinearity, I'll show it to you, make more sense. And then outliers, and then what are called ecological correlations. I think we have an example of each. So nonlinearity. Okay. So this relationship clearly not a line, right? It's a curve. Okay. So that means this correlation trick doesn't work. Okay. In fact, it will give you really, really confusing results. Okay. So um, sometimes it can give you an indicator that you should be using another method. Um, but when kind of like when it's perfectly nonlinear almost, um, it basically just gives you zero. Okay. But there is clearly a relationship there, right? It's just that it's not a linear relationship. So the correlation coefficient doesn't work. Okay. But they have a relationship, right? When, you know, depending on where you are on the X, the Y is, is kind of, you know, doing something. So if you get closer to zero, the y gets smaller, right? And as we get further away from zero or more positive on the x, the y gets bigger. So there's definitely a relationship, it's just not linear. So therefore, the correlation coefficient is lower. Okay. So if we took half of it, maybe it would work, right? All right. The other thing that can really mess it up is, is severe outliers. Um, let's see if I can get more screen real estate on this computer. Um, but let's see. So, you know, so when we have, um, this is just the number one and four, right? Very strong correlation, right? They go, they go straight up together, right? But then if I put in kind of a major outlier, okay? So basically I just make it five zero instead of five five, that's also gonna screw up the correlation, okay? And again, this is why outliers are so important because you know, if I saw this data, although it's only five, so not really, but if I saw this data and I saw this kind of reaction, my thinking would be to take out that five, right? Because everything else has a really strong relationship, right? It's just that these kind of simple samples are really just not right. So it, it's likely I would really go investigate, are they just an error? Like, did we collect the data poorly? Something like that, right? Um, because it's likely that those are weird. Okay. Um, not all the time, but sometimes it's worth this is the thing that would indicate investigation time. Okay. Then we have the ecological considerations. This one is interesting. So uh, imagine we have a table of people who took the SATs um, and by state. So we say Alabama, the percentage of people who took it is 6.7, um, and the critical reading average score was 547, math was 538, writing was 532, and the combined 16 and 17. It's particularly funny that these numbers mean nothing to me because when I took the SAT, it only had two sections. Um, still very weird. Um, so, what does this tell us? Okay, so we see. Um, when we look at critical reading and math, um, they what, what's going on here? What do you think? People who did better in critical reading tend to do better. Right, that seems to be a, a strong relationship. However, what we're not taking into account, and we'll see the correlation that proves you're exactly right, quote unquote. But what we're not taking into account here is that. The, the relationships are, are not, like we're not really comparing apples to apples in these tables, in this table, right? Because the participation rate in Alabama was 6.7%. And the participation rate in Florida was 72%. So it's 
So it may be that if the other whatever would be 94%, 93% of Alabamians taking are not taking the SAT because they are, you know, just not, it's not available to them for whatever reason, which means that the relationship may not actually be there, but we're missed. And like our population understanding is bad. Okay. So it's, it's not that we don't have a good sample, we don't have a, a complete enough sample in a sense. It's more like where we do have data is not necessarily representative of the thing we're looking at. Okay. Because, like, for example, the difference in, in the participation between Alabama and Florida. Okay. So if we went and deleted all the results except to make them all 7% participation rate, maybe we get to something better. But the data we're looking at is not kind of like evenly distributed across the data sets. We might also have much better success in trying to figure out those relationships here by looking at, say, just Alabama, right? And maybe we can do something there. But then we'd want to know if it, how is it broken down by county, et cetera. Because it could just be that um, maybe we have a bunch of examples where relatively low participation rate from, let's say, very affluent areas Okay, so but all, all of it is very affluent. And so in general, affluent tends to be better educated um, and so and have more opportunity for, for these kinds of things. So maybe that's the relationship is that if you if your family has more money, you do better in critical reading and math. But we're we're mistaking it by saying we think it's because the math and the critical reading have a relationship, but in fact it's the fact that the people who believe in that 7% in Alabama all come from affluent families. Maybe. Like, I really have no idea, and that's the whole problem, right? Does that make sense? So this is called an etological consideration, because basically the ecology of the data set is, is questionable, okay? Or, or it's actually, I mean, the data is fine, right? It's just that we're, we're kind of like, indicating that there, we're trying to draw a conclusion from it that the data doesn't really support because of the nature of the data itself, not because there's anything wrong with how we're doing the calculations or that kind of stuff. It's just that the, the nature of the data that we collected is not really good for the conclusion we're trying to draw. All right. Okay. All right. Um, let me just see. Okay, so we'll do this real quick, and then I think yeah, we only have one more uh, thing I want to talk about. Okay, so raise your right hand if you think the value of R on the let's say on the right side uh, is higher. Um, and note, I am saying. I want to know which number is higher, okay? Not stronger correlation. Or maybe we should do stronger correlation, anyway. All right, we do stronger correlation. Uh, let's see, which way do I have the answers? Ah, so I have the answers as, uh, as which number is higher, okay? So keep in mind, right, that there might be a strong negative correlation, but that would be a lower number, right? So, okay, so raise your right hand if you think the uh, in A, just that A goes to, uh, if you think the correlation on the right is higher than the correlation on the left, and left hand on the left. All right, all right, so clearly that's a gimme, because uh, almost all of you got it right. All right, so let's go on to B and do that one. What do you think? So which one's higher? All right, get your hands up. I see I see some people with no hands up. Right hand for the picture on the right in B, right, which is the bottom left corner, can't read the letters. Um, and uh, left hand, if you think the left side one has a higher correlation. All right, so the correct answer is right hand, okay? Um, because the correlation is actually less strong Right, and so therefore it's a higher number because it's closer to zero, even though they're both negative correlations. This is the reason I ask these questions because 
Yeah, it's like this is a very easy mistake to make. Um, all right, so what about C? That's the top right corner, uh, right hand or left hand. I think you know the drill at this point. Uh, this one's also got some subtlety to it. All right, what did I do? Yeah. Okay, so left hands have it. Anybody know why? The outliers. Because the outliers. Those those like three dots in the bottom right corner over there really throw off the correlation. Um, all right, and then D. Let's see. All right, that's pretty good. The right hand is is correct, um, and this one, the outliers actually kind of help the correlation, right? Because they're like evenly balanced. All right. And then the last slide uh, is one of my favorites of speaking of those ecological considerations. Oops, wrong computer. Um, is uh, with increased chocolate consumption comes more Nobel prizes. So I think that's a great correlation. I think we should run with it and decide that all chocolate uh, consumption is good uh, and will cause you to win a Nobel Prize. Um, so there is a relationship here, right? Okay, this is probably not the ecological problem. It doesn't seem to have any particularly strong outliers. Okay, it has an R like in this graphic, right? You see that 0 0.79, that's pretty strong, positive correlation, but it's probably not false. Exactly. Right. But it's kind of interesting nonetheless. Um, so who knows? Maybe one of you will prove that there is a causal relationship between them. And I think we're going to stop there uh, before we actually get to the predictions I promised, um, which is the heavy predictions. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, so I put the yeah, pull off, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's say 1024 at the time. Oh. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. One thousand people. All right. Thanks for coming.